Hello and welcome to this Nature.com custom webcast, sponsored by Andor Technology and presented by Macmillan Science Communication. My name is Jill Addy and I will be your moderator for today's webcast, the latest innovations in real-time imaging of cells with super-resolution microscopy. Andor, founded in 1989, are a world leader in scientific imaging, spectroscopy solutions and microscopy systems. And the theme of this webcast is on new technical innovations for super-resolution microscopy. Our first speaker is Dr. Jennifer Lippincott-Schwartz, an NIH Distinguished Investigator who will discuss her research using genetically encoded photoactivatable proteins for super-resolution imaging. Our second speaker is Dr. Susan Cox from King's College in London, who will discuss the algorithms which facilitate high-resolution imaging of live cell dynamics. Lastly, Dr. Orla Hanrahan, an application specialist at Andor, will discuss detector technologies. At the end of our presentations, there will be some time for a live question and answer session. To ask us a question, you need to type it in the questions panel at any point during the presentation, and we will answer them at the end. We will try our best to answer as many questions as we can, and we'll follow up with those we didn't have time for after the session. You can join our discussion on Twitter by using the hashtag MSCWebcast in your message. And lastly, a recording of this webcast, including the slide presentations, will be available to view again at our website, nature.com slash webcasts. And now I shall hand over to Jennifer. It's a real pleasure to be here today. I'd like to talk about navigating the cellular landscape through single molecule imaging. Now in the next slide, what you're looking at is an aggregate of 50 nanometer polystyrene beads that have been coated with a photoactivatable fluorescent protein. And to the left is a conventional wide field micrograph showing the fluorescence of this aggregate of beads. And what you can see is there's very little resolution that one can see with regards to the distribution of the individual beads in that image. And that's because of the diffractional emitted light, which prevents any two objects closer than 250 nanometers from being resolved from each other. On the right is a photoactivated localization microscopic image that has, as you can see, much greater resolution to the tune of about 20 nanometers in XY. And that allows one to see the distribution of these individual beads in this aggregate. If you zoom up in the next slide, you can see the distribution of those individual beads because of this incredibly improved resolution capability of this technology. Now what these point localization super resolution imaging approaches, which is how I'm going to be describing them, are based on is the ability of individual point light emitters like GFP, as shown in this next slide here, to be able to fit the centroid of the point spread function that is given off by that fluorescent protein when you look at it under a lens. And so what one can see in this next slide here is this microscope point spread function, which is what one typically sees when one looks at a point light source emitter under a microscope. The approach of these single molecule imaging approaches is to fit the centroid of that PSF and with that have precision for the localization of that individual molecule. Now with these techniques, the greater number of photons that a fluorescent protein gives off, the better the 2D Gaussian fit and the more precision you have in localizing the particular molecule. Now what these super resolution approaches do in order to acquire a full image of individual molecules at very high density is to sequentially photoactivate and bleach molecules successively in time. And what that then allows one to do is fit the centroid of the PSF corresponding to a particular molecule with very high precision at low enough density so that in particular frames you have the precision to see individual molecules. Then when you sum up all of those frames, you can superimpose those positions to create a super resolution image. So this is the basis of palm microscopy as well as an assortment of other point localization based super resolution approaches. The next slide shows the data acquisition mechanism 
uh, here is a time-lapse sequence where we're just collecting images of single molecules from a thin section of a specimen that's been labeled with a photoactivatable fluorescent protein. And to the left, you can see the individual raw photoactivated molecules as they come up. To the far right, in the palm image, you can see the fitted locations of the individual molecules as they activate and then bleach. So this approach of using fitting of individual molecules temporally and then summing the distributions together, we call point localization super-resolution microscopy. It's based on a pointillism approach, if you will, and that's illustrated in this diagram of this cow that you can see uh, with greater and greater resolution built on the acquisition of distributions of individual points. Now, there is a large number of these point localization super-resolution microscopy techniques that we now are employing. Palm uses photoactivatable fluorescent proteins, but just as importantly are these techniques of storm and de-storm that use photoactivatable or photo-switchable fluorescent dyes. And there's even some techniques, G-Shrimp and Balm, that use just conventional fluorescent proteins in a bleaching, blinking modality to acquire the necessary isolation of individual molecules in a dense population to localize individual molecules and then sum them up to create a super-resolution image. Now, what all of these point localization SR images enable is tenfold improvement of resolution of structures of interest within the cell. And so in this next image here, we're comparing one of these technologies, BOM, with ImmunoEM, you can nicely see the resolution improvement over diffraction-limited imaging of a microtubule. To the far right is an ImmunoEM showing the distribution with gold label of individual tubulin molecules along a microtubule. In the center, you can see a BOM image that's based on just bleaching and blinking acquisition of individual molecules of tubulin that is localized on this structure. Now what I'd like to talk about is the transformable areas that these technologies are enabling, and they fall into three areas, structural analysis, dynamic processes, and protein organization, and stoichiometry. Now foremost is this structural analysis area which most people who are employing these techniques are using. The goal is to get greater insight into the localization of molecules associated with particular structures. Now, in order for this to be successful, what one needs is structural context for palm or storm or de-storm images. And one way that's been accomplished is by correlating these images with electron microscopy as shown in this particular image where a palm image of a matrix-targeted mitochondrial fluorescent probe has been superimposed on an electron micrograph so that you can see the correlated distribution of the individual molecules highlighted in red with the electron micrograph of the entire structure and its surrounding cytoplasm. Now, another important improvement in structural analysis that we have seen is the ability to simultaneously look at two or more photoactivatable or photoreversible dyes in a particular super-resolution image, as well as to do 3D visualization of these molecules. And the 3D visualization has been accomplished through a number of different uh, strategies. In this next slide, we're looking at uh, one approach using interferometry, which is able to give a gain of axial resolution to about 10 nanometers, uh, which is quite remarkable. What this image illustrates is the fine organization of the plasma membrane that is visible with this technique. Individual molecules are color-coded based on their Z position in this image. Uh, if you rotate this rectangular area and look at it in X and Z, you can see the top and the bottom of the plasma membrane that defines this very flat leading edge of the cell. This is something that 
previously people have only been able to look at using electron microscopy because of the diffraction limit of light microscopy. But now with this interferometric combined palm approach, we're able to see this type of very fine resolution. Here is just another example where we're looking at the endoplasmic reticulum, again using interferometric palm, looking at the distribution of a particular molecule reticulum within that ER. Each of the individual molecules are color-coded based on their Z position, shown with that lookup table. Now moving on to a second area where these point localization super resolution imaging approaches is having a big impact is the area of dynamic processes. Now one can look at dynamic structures or one can look at dynamic molecules using this point localization technology. What I want to focus on here is the ability to study the dynamics of individual molecules, which is quite easy to do. One can just express a protein of interest that's tagged with a photoactivatable fluorescent protein and collect over time very quickly, essentially in this image that you're seeing here where we're looking at a viral glycoprotein BSVG and its dynamics on the plasma membrane. We're collecting the images at 20 frames per second, localizing in each frame to 25 nanometers. And what that allows us to do is in each frame we can position the molecule so that over time we can actually follow the trajectory of that molecule at very high resolution. What these trajectories allow one to do is to investigate the dynamic diffusional properties of these molecules. And we can do this at very high density of molecules because of the ability to sequentially photoactivate and photobleach these molecules. You can get thousands of trajectories and from those trajectories, you can plot diffusion coefficients and get insight into the overall dynamic behavior of these molecules in different environments within the cell. In this diffusion map, shown in this next slide here, we're comparing two different plasma membrane proteins, VSBG and a GAG protein that is part of the coat complex of the HIV virus. And what you can see is that the individual molecules show very different diffusion characteristics as well as overall exploration of the plasma membrane. Whereas VSVG is moving very quickly all over the plasma membrane, the HIV gag on the bottom is pretty much immobile and most of the molecules are localized in clusters of about 200 nanometers in diameter which fits very nicely with their movement into viral particles that butt off the plasma membrane in these cells. Now moving on to this third process, protein organization and stoichiometry, this is an area that has excited, really ignited the field of plasma membrane receptor signaling because it allows one to begin to get insight into how signaling molecules undergo dramatic changes in their distribution in response to signaling inputs. And in this particular example here where we're looking at the T-cell receptor stimulation effect on two signaling molecules, LAT and SLIP76, you can see that in response to that CD3 antibody signal, these molecules undergo dramatic changes in their clustering. Now, of course, researchers in the immunology as well as cell biology field are very interested in downstream consequences of those clusters. What's critical as a first step is to understand the characteristics of those clusters. That is, what's the size and density of these membrane microdomains that are forming in response to these signaling cues. And one approach that has proved to be very powerful for interrogating these changes in distribution of these molecules is pairwise correlation. So what this approach does is to correlate individual molecules that have been localized with very high precision with each other in these dense images that are acquired from palm or storm images. I just want to show you an example where we have done that type of pair correlation palm analysis looking at a variety of different plasma membrane proteins, including GPI, LIN, LAT, and VSVG. All of these proteins localize in the plasma membrane and with diffraction limited imaging appear very uniform in their distribution. 
But if we interrogate them using percorrelation POM, what one can see in this next slide is that these molecules are actually exhibiting clustering characteristics on the plasma membrane. And each molecule has very different cluster sizes that it steady state dynamically localizes in and exhibits different densities of concentration within these particular clusters. And that's illustrated in this data laid out here. The next slide just shows a diagram that interprets that data showing what we think is a fairly reasonable representation of the steady state distribution of these four molecules based on their paracorrelation POM analysis. Now, if we modulate conditions, for instance, adding signaling components, antibodies for cross-linking, depolymerizing microtubule actin cytoskeleton, or perturb the cholesterol distribution on the plasma membrane, what we've seen is dramatic changes in the steady state organization of these clusters and densities of molecules in these clusters. And that's all possible because of these new approaches for analyzing these POM data sets. So I want to conclude by saying that these point localization imaging technologies, including POM and STORM and DSTORM, are very powerful for exploring various aspects of the cell environment. You can look at dynamic processes. You can look at structural features of objects and go down to single molecule protein organization and stoichiometry. So with that, I want to thank all of the people who've been involved in this work. This includes not only members of my own lab, but key collaborators that have been really essential for allowing us to be able to put this type of technology into action. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jennifer, for your presentation. And now we'll hear from Susan. Thank you very much for the introduction and to Jennifer for the great introduction to localization microscopy. I'd like to talk today about how we can accelerate localization microscopy, in particular to allow us to image dynamics in live cells. Now, we've seen what you can do if you have really nice sparse data. But what happens if you're trying to go faster and the raw data becomes very dense? If you have ideal localization microscopy data, it's low density with very well separated fluorophores and no problem to analyze. But if you want to go faster, it would be a big advantage to have many more fluorophores emitting in each frame. So if you try and increase the density, what happens? Well, eventually fluorophores will start to overlap in each image, the localization algorithm will threshold these out, and the number of fluorophores which you have in your final reconstructed image will decrease. So what approaches could we take with dense data to get more information out? Well, what we can do is use our knowledge of the system to build a model with more information, which will then give us more resolution. We can either use our knowledge of what overlapping fluorophores look like in each frame to separate them out, that's using spatial information, or we can use our knowledge of how things are changing over time to improve the resolution, or of course, a combination of both. So in each frame, we can model the fact that fluorophores can overlap. Here I illustrate the method of Fang Huang et al, showing that you can start with a patch, which we assume to contain one fluorophore. Then if that doesn't fit the data well, you gradually add more fluorophores until a good fit is achieved. Of course, the disadvantage is you have to have some form of regularization in there to stop it fitting infinite fluorophores. This method has also been implemented in three dimensions by Babcock et al. Or we can use bleaching. Here we see the integrated intensity versus time for two molecules which are close to each other initially. Over time, one of the molecules bleaches, and eventually the second bleaches. When we subtract the images, we're able to get images of each molecule separately, which we can then localize, and those localization positions can be used to create a reconstructed image. This has been used by several groups with increasingly creative acronyms, starting with Single Molecule High Resolution Imaging with Photo Bleaching by Petal Salvin et al. Bleaching Blinking Assisted Localization Microscopy by Burnett and Jennifer, 
and photobleaching microscopy with nonlinear processing, winning the best acronym title of PIMP by Munk et al. in 2012. Now, temporal variations can be used instead of looking in a single frame and trying to piece out which fluorophore is where when they're overlapping. There are two main methods that use this. The first is super-resolution optical fluctuation imaging by Dertinger et al. And this assumes that the fluctuation of fluorophores is statistically independent and it looks at cumulants of the image. The higher order the cumulant, the better resolution the image. Now, what are cumulants? Here we're looking at temporal cumulants, relations between pixels over time, and to give an idea, the second order cumulant is a standard deviation. Independent component analysis is another method which can be used to separate out fluorophores which are very close together and on at the same time when there is temporal information present. In our approach, we use both spatial and temporal information and build a hidden Markov model of the entire data set. This takes into account that the image arises from many fluorophores which undergo both blinking and bleaching. We create a model of the sample which has a number of fluorophores with unknown parameters. Now this is a Bayesian method, so we're going to evaluate all the evidence for the model, for each possible model, and select the model with the most evidence. The model of our system is made up of the fluorophores, each of which have a brightness, size, position, and state sequence. Now what I mean by a state sequence is whether the fluorophore is emitting light or not, or whether it's permanently bleached in a given frame. And in order to get our result, we integrate over all state sequences and then decide which model is the best. Now, a key element of our method is that in order to achieve results before the heat death of the universe occurs, we have to take statistical samples of our state sequences using Monte Carlo Markov chain. Each of these samples is equally valid, and so we're able to build up a probability distribution of where the fluorophores are, even though we don't get individual positions of the fluorophores out of our method. To give you a biological example of something that we've looked at, I'd like to show you some results on podosomes. These are cytoskeletal structures which form at the cell membrane. They consist of an actin core around 500 nanometers diameter, surrounded by a ring of proteins, including vinculin, tailin, paxillin, and integrin. They are implicated in a number of physiological processes, such as arteriosclerosis, osteoporosis, and cancer metastasis. Here you see raw data from fixed cells, where we have a labeled with Alexa 488 and mounted in PBS with 100 millimolar of mercaptoethanol, and you can see blinking is occurring. Here is the wide field image, and here is the processed image where you can see the resolution has been substantially improved. I realize that this doesn't give much idea of what's happening when the algorithm operates on the data set, so I've created an audio file which lets you hear the optimization occurring. Maybe you heard the disorder at the beginning in that audio file and then the disorder dying away and the same tones coming through over and over again. But of course, what's really interesting when you can accelerate the acquisition in this way is to look at dynamic processes in live cells. Here I'm showing podosomes with an M-cherry partial tailing construct imaged with a completely standard wide field system. And here we apply our method, Bayesian Analysis of Blinking and Bleaching, which we call 3B because everyone has to have an acronym, to this data. Now on the left, you see a wide field image where 200 frames at a time have been averaged. And on the right, those same 200 frames have been analyzed with a 3B algorithm 
to give us a super resolution image with about 50 nanometers resolution. Now, this is a very motile cell, so the time scale of the whole video is 1 minute 40 seconds, and each frame corresponds to 4 seconds. And you can see the podosomes forming and dissociating over time. You can also do two colors at the same time. Here we see both tailin and vinculin, and you can see they overlap well. 3B has also been applied to a number of other systems, particularly yeast that we see at the top, uh, and this was recently published in Nature Communications, microtubules in fixed neuron, with thanks to Tally Lambert, whose data this is, and cardio sites, with thanks to Matthias Gautel for the sample. And now I'd like to present some work by Patrick Fox Roberts, who's been tackling the issue of computation time. The major disadvantage of 3B is it does take a long time to get a good processed image. Pat has been using a Gaussian mixture model, where you start with one Gaussian per pixel and then gradually cull them based on their resemblance to the image. Now the advantage of this is that the regularization is fairly weak and because the classification is based on how like a Gaussian the image appears, effectively no thresholding is required. Having more methods available allows us to trade off acquisition and analysis speed. Here we see the same actin fiber analyzed with three different methods. 3B gives us the most of the structure, but the slowest analysis. As we go towards quick palm, we get faster analysis, but if we wanted to get the same amount of data, we would have to have slower acquisition. All of the methods that I've presented today lie somewhere along this trade-off. So, in conclusion, localization analysis of very dense data can be achieved by using a hidden Markov model, which allows us to do live cell imaging of 4 seconds temporal resolution and 50 nanometers spatial resolution without any special photoswitchable fluorophores. We've released an ImageJ plugin for this method, and the Kang group has also released an application to allow you to upload your dataset to the Amazon cloud. I've also presented Gaussian mixture modeling, which can allow you to look at moderately dense data with much faster analysis than 3B. So it's important when deciding what method you want to use to think about how it's best for you to trade off acquisition speed and analysis speed. And finally, I'd just like to thank my group, Patrick Fox Roberts and Adela Stazowska, all my collaborators and my funders, the Royal Society, the MRC and the BBFRC. Thanks, Susan, and now it's time to hear from Orla. Okay, so today we will talk about sensor detectors for super resolution. Uh, so EMCCGs and SCMOS detectors can be used for this particular application. So the first slide, um, slide number one, what makes a detector sensitive? So there are two key parameters here, and these are very important parameters. So the first is quantum efficiency, and quantum efficiency defines how efficient your sensor is at converting your photons into photoelectrons. So the more efficient your sensor is at this, the better it is at seeing those photons. So generally, back-illuminated sensors are more quantum efficient than front-illuminated sensors. The noise floor is also very important. So this ball in the grass is representing the noise. So the signal is your ball and the grass is the noise floor. So you want to be able to see your signal above the noise floor. The camera must be designed to ensure that both of these parameters are optimized. So the second slide then is making sense of sensitivity. Um, so this is a representation of noise within a sensor. So you have read noise, which is your usual camera detection limit. You have your dark noise, which is dependent on temperature. So obviously, the cooler your camera is, the lower your dark noise is. And you have shot noise, which is QE and signal dependent. So the read noise, which is your usual camera detection limit, there's a general rule of thumb here. So the slower you read out your sensor, the lower the read noise. So if you want to get very, very clean images, you read your sensor out nice and slow, and you get very low read noise. Obviously, if you acquire very fast frame rates, then you will have higher read noise. The third slide here now shows the typical quantum efficiency curves. So you have your back illuminated sensor quantum efficiency curve here showing you the quantum efficiency over 90%. So these back illuminated sensors are very quantum efficient. 
So generally they're above 90%, which means that 90% of your photons will be converted into photoelectrons. So slide number four now is showing you the SCMOS QE curve. So the previous slide, which shows you the back illuminated QE curves, was generally what we have in our EM CCD cameras. So all EM CCD cameras are back illuminated, so therefore they all have a quantum efficiency over 90%. With the SCMOS then, the SCMOS is a front illuminated sensor and it has a slightly lower quantum efficiency. So here we have represented uh, two SCMOS sensors from the Andor range of cameras. We have a Xyla 5.5 and a Xyla 4.2. The Xyla 4.2 is a higher quantum efficiency than the Xyla 5.5. It's approximately 72% quantum efficiency at 600 nanometers. Therefore, 72% of your photons will be converted into photoelectrons in the Xyla 4.2. The difference between the 4.2 and 5.5 is not only in the quantum efficiency, but it's also in the actual sensor. So the 4.2 sensor is a 4T or 4 transistor sensor. The 5.5 then is a 5T or 5 transistor sensor. The 4.2 has a higher quantum efficiency but lacks the global shutter mode which is required for some dynamic events in life science applications, whereas the 5.5 or 5T sensor has both rolling shutter and global shutter modes. Um, therefore, because it has an extra exposure mode or shutter mode, it has a lower quantum efficiency. So over the last, say, 10 to 15 years, the MCCD cameras have been the camera of choice for researchers when it comes to super resolution. And this is because the MCCD cameras eliminate read noise detection limit. So I said previously that the read noise was a detection limit in cameras. And the general rule of thumb is the slower you read out, the lower the read noise. However, with EMCCDs, you can read out extremely fast and you have very low read noise. And this is because of the EM gain advantage on the EMCCDs. So what you can do in an EMCCD is you can increase the signal using EM gain, which is electron multiplication, and this all happens before the read noise is applied. So your signal becomes amplified and your read noise becomes negligible at this point. The EM CCDs also have a very high quantum efficiency. So they're back illuminated sensors, generally with a quantum efficiency above 90%. Therefore, your 90% of your photons will be converted into photoelectrons and therefore you can get fast frame rates without sacrificing your noise floor. So these were the ideal and still are the ideal camera for super resolution or single molecule detection. So this slide here shows you the EM gain enhancing fluorescence microscopy. So on the left hand side, you've got two images where there's no EM gain applied. And this would be what you would see if you look through the eyepiece. So if you have a very low light signal, you see a lot of read noise and very low signal itself. However, once you apply EM gain, you then see your images are very sharp, very crisp, highly resolved, and the read noise has been removed. So this is the advantage of using EM gain in EM CCDs for any fluorescent microscopy applications. In order to do any fast acquisitions, you need to be able to obviously acquire your images as fast as possible on your camera. And even in super resolution, people want to acquire as fast as possible because in super resolution, you're acquiring thousands of images. So the faster you can acquire these images, the better. But also now that super resolution is moving into the live cell imaging stage, we need to go as fast as possible as well. So how can you do this using the EMCCD? Well, if you add an optomask, which is an accessory which attaches to the camera via a C-mount, you can actually fool the sensor into thinking it is smaller than it actually is. So what we have is we have a cropped mode, which is a mode where you can basically fool the sensor into thinking it is smaller than it actually is. So the Ixon 897 or the Ixon Ultra 897 is our most popular sensor, which is used for super resolution applications. This has a 512 by 512 sensor size. If you use the OptoMask, you can physically mask the sensor and fool it into thinking it is smaller. So um, therefore, you can actually increase your speeds dramatically. So this is an example. The standard ROI mode is on the first table on top. And if you look at 128 by 128, you can acquire 212 frames per second in the standard ROI mode. So choosing a region of interest, not masking the sensor, you can achieve 212 frames per second. 
Once you use the crop sensor mode and add your optimal mask to mask out the sensors, you can achieve 595 frames per second. So this is a huge increase in terms of frame rates and it's very beneficial for super resolution applications. Slide number nine then shows you a new feature where we have optically centered the crop mode where, for example, in super resolution applications, the majority of the aberrations will occur around the edges of your image. So previously, we always had to place the cropped mode in the bottom left hand corner of the sensor in order to get the fastest frame rates. However, we've now developed the optically centered crop mode. So everything now is centered on the center of the sensor and you'll have no aberrations at the side. And with this, you get your 572 frames per second, which is perfect for live cell super resolution. And this table just shows you again, at a crop mode of 128 by 128 in the center of the sensor, you can achieve 572 frames per second. So I showed you a QE curve earlier, which shows you the 5.5 and the 4.2 SCMOS sensors. So this is a 5T and a 4T sensor. Um, and in the image here, you can see a Neo and a Xyla. So the Neo is a 5T sensor, whereas the Xyla comes in a 5.5 and a 4.2 so you have basically rolling and global shutter in the Neo and the Xyla 5.5 and you have rolling shutter only in the Xyla 4.2 but with a higher QE of 72% at 600 nanometers. This higher QE in the 4T benefits super resolution applications and therefore this sensor would be ideal. The FCMOS sensors in general are unique in simultaneously offering extremely low noise so the SCMOS sensors are different from EMCCGs. It's a different architecture altogether. So you get extremely low noise without actually having to multiply your electrons. So with the EM gain, you're getting low noise, but you have to use an amplification in order to get these low noise values. With the SCMOS, you can get less than one electron without multiplication. You can also achieve rapid frame rates. So 100 frames per second from a five megapixel sensor but faster with smaller ROIs. So with the full field of view, SCMOS sensors are much larger than the EMCCG sensors. So you have 5.5 megapixels or 4.2 megapixels. And with both of those, you can achieve 100 frames per second sustained for as long as you want. Obviously, if you use smaller ROIs, you can get much, much faster frame rates. Again, this is ideal for super resolution. It's a very wide dynamic range. These sensors have a 33,000 to 1 dynamic range, therefore allowing you to see both very bright signals and very low intensity signals in one image simultaneously. The high QE, as I mentioned, is 72%. This is in the 4.2, the Xyla 4.2. This camera would be ideal because of the high quantum efficiency in converting those super resolution fluorescent molecules into photoelectrons. High resolution, you have 5.5 megapixels with 6.5 micron pixels. So nice small pixels in order to get the best resolution from your images. And as I said, a very large field of view. So what do you choose? Would you choose EMCCGs or would you choose SCMOS for super resolution? So this slide here is gonna describe what you need for super resolution. In terms of a detector, you need something that's sensitive. So PAM or STORM, the super resolution techniques are single molecule detection approaches. And um, generally they're very low light and you need something that's fast. You want to acquire multiple images as fast as possible for summation. And obviously you have live cell possibilities as well. The faster imaging means shorter exposures, reducing your signal to noise ratio. So you need something sensitive and you need something very fast. So these plots here show you the cutoff point in terms of when you use EMCCGs or when you use SCMOS sensors. So on the left hand side, you can see, for example, if you look at the green curve, which is crossing over with the blue. So the green is the Xyla 4.2. The blue is your back illuminated EMCCG. So you're saying 34 photons per pixel is your cutoff point. So anything below that level, you would use an EMCCG. However, if you have 34 photons per pixel or above, SCMOS is perfect. So just to finish off then, EMCCGs are a high-end solution. They're generally more expensive than SCMOS cameras, but they are single molecule detectors and they eliminate read noise. So for very low light imaging and single molecule detection, EMCCG is the camera of choice. Also for spinning disc on focal microscopy, EMCCGs are this camera of choice here because it's an ultra sensitive technology with very low light levels. 
Uh, CMOS then is amazing volume. It's a superb price performance workhorse camera. We do say that it's an interline replacement technology, but it's also an alternative to EM CCDs for super resolution techniques such as PAM or STORM due to the extremely fast frame rates, the low noise, the high QE and the low fan vibration. Thank you very much. Thank you to our presenters for their presentations today. And now it's time to take questions from you, the audience. To ask us a question, just type your question into the questions box and um, we'll get them through here and answer them just now. If we don't have time to get around to your question, we'll follow up by email afterwards. If you're watching this on demand, please feel free to ask questions up to a week after the live event and we'll also follow up with you by email. So, on to the questions that we've received so far. I've had a really good question in here um, and this one is for you, Orla. Um, this is, why would you choose SCMOS over EMCCD or vice versa? Okay, thanks, Jill. Um, I suppose um, because we're talking about super resolution here, um, the camera of choice has always been the EMCCD camera. Um, and this is because it's a, an extremely sensitive camera. And um, I suppose super resolution techniques are really looking at uh, single fluorescent probes. So um, it's also a, a very good detector for single molecules. Um, but, however, we have recently launched um, the new um, SDMOS, which is uh, the Xyla 4.2, and due to its very high quantum efficiency um, and its uh, very small pixels and large field of view and fast frame rates, it's also an ideal detector for super resolution. So both cameras can be used. Um, uh, we would always, I suppose, um, advise a user to maybe look at both detectors, um, depending on their particular application and their level of light. Um, SDMOS will work, um, but if you have extremely low light levels, EMCCD cameras are a lot better, and um, they're a lot more sensitive. Um, but just in terms of um, the, both detectors, they can easily be used for the, for the same application. Thanks, Ola. Um, and now I have a question for Susan. Uh, Susan, this came in from uh, Parajet at Baylor College of Medicine, uh, and they ask, what is the time duration over which the signal needs to be integrated to create the palm image? Well, this is a, a really interesting question. It depends on a number of things, actually. Um, firstly, it depends on um, how, uh, what your blinking characteristics are, so how many fluorophores you're getting in each image, that uh, changes how many images you'll need to collect, uh, and that changes your acquisition time. It depends on the frame rate of your camera, uh, and it also depends, of course, on what data analysis you're going to be doing afterwards. So your um, density of fluorophores is going to have to be very sparse uh, if you're going to do a simple data analysis. If you're going to do a dense data analysis, it'll be quite high. So in terms of uh, a typical sparse collection, you'd be looking at several minutes. Um, you would then also have to spend several minutes analyzing. If you wanted to analyze faster, then you can collect in just a few seconds or even sub-second if you have good switching characteristics um, and you use a very dense data analysis technique. On the other hand, you will spend a lot more time analyzing the data, more on the time scale of hours. Thanks, Susan. Um, I have another question for Orla here, but actually before we go on, um, I just want to tell everyone that unfortunately we've lost our connection with Jennifer, um, so I'm just going to hold her questions back uh, until we can either get her back or otherwise we'll follow up um, by email for her questions. I apologize for that, um, but here's a question for Orla. Uh, this is also from Paradet. How does EMCCD compare with ICCD? Okay, so in terms of these two technologies, they're very, very different technologies. Um, so EMCCD is your uh, electron multiplying uh, charge couple device, which is used um, for a lot of uh, applications, very low light applications, um, and it works by uh, amplifying your signal and also uh, removing your read noise. So the signal is actually amplified before the read noise is even added. So these cameras are ideal for very, very low light um, applications. So instead of having to increase your laser intensities or your light intensities or having to increase your exposure times, you can actually achieve very fast frame rates and very sensitive um, 
images and very good images, very good resolution images with your EMCCDs. ICCDs then are intensified charge couple devices. They're very different technologies. Um, they're also used a lot with spectrographs. So they're more spectroscopy-based cameras than um, microscopy-based cameras. Um, there's, a very, there's a lot of um, technical differences between these two. So instead of going into all the detail now, what I can do is follow up in an email with you, and we can have a discussion offline about this technology, about the two technologies and their differences. So I hope that's satisfactory for you. Thanks, Ola. That sounds like a really good idea. Okay. Thanks. Um, and I have a question that's come in from, uh, from Jeremy at Medical Research Council. So this is a really good question for both of you, actually. Um, this is, how is the optimum frame rate for live cell super resolution calculated, i.e. for 572 frames per second? Um, Susan, maybe you could start with this? Yeah, this is, um, this is a very interesting question because it, uh, it involves a trade-off of uh, several different aspects uh, of imaging against each other. So, of course, um, it depends firstly on what density of fluorophores that you can tolerate. So, if you're, if you're just thinking about you're doing a localization image, you need to collect a certain number of fluorophores. You can collect so many fluorophores for image. How many images will it take you? Uh, and that, that's uh, relatively easy to calculate. Um, however, of course, if you're doing live cells, you also have the issue that you're going to be um, you're going to be poisoning your sample. It's going to be have phototoxic effects as you're imaging it. So um, you then have to, for your particular cell line, work out how bad the phototoxic effects are. Whether you can um, whether you can uh, get enough photons per molecule per frame to get the localizations that you want. Uh, and then you also have to consider. Um, the fact that uh, in each, uh, so we have in each frame, we have a certain number of molecules, we have a phototoxic effect, and then we also have the fact that the molecules themselves change their blinking characteristics as you change the intensity. So if you think, well, I want to go at 500 frames per second, I need, say, 300 photons or 5,000 photons, depending on the accuracy you want, to get a certain localization accuracy. But then, let's say that you use the laser power that you need to get that throughput, you'll also change the blinking characteristics. So if you're using a photo switchboard molecule, you'll need to then change your switching. Or if you're using a uh, non-photo switchboard molecule, you may uh, then run into problems because you simply can't image at that uh, rate. And that's certainly particularly a problem imaging in live cells with non-photo switchable fluorophores. You lose a certain degree of control and you are limited by the way that the blinking changes when you increase the intensity. Thanks. And, and Orla, did you have anything to add? Yeah. So um, I'm not sure if uh, – I think this question was asked during my presentation. So I think it might be also in relation to um, one of the features that we have on our camera called um, the COP the crop mode. So the crop mode is um, ideal for live cell super resolution, and we have this now on the EMCCD camera, and it's optically centered as well. So um, I suppose the, the nice thing about this is it's optically centered, so any aberrations that may occur um, in generally in super resolution, they will occur around the edges. So having these optically centered means that it's the ideal location. Um, also, um, I know in super resolution applications, the large um, or the full frame is generally not used in, a, in a, um, a sensor. So, for example, if you have a 512 by 512 sensor, you might only use a, the very, a very small area like 128 by 128 pixels. So if you use the cropped mode uh, feature, you can actually fool the sensor into thinking it's smaller than it actually is. So in that way, the sensor doesn't have to read out all of the rows of the, um, all of the, rows of the pixels. Um, it's cropped, it, uh, it's masked as well, so you have a mask which covers the, the area that you're not interested in, and therefore you can achieve a lot faster frame rates. And these faster frame rates can be achieved, obviously, if you're using um, a short exposure time, um, and it is also dependent on the vertical shift and the horizontal readout. So there's a lot of parameters on the camera itself, you know, um, relating to the speed at which you can read out. 
Um, but if you're using EM CCGs, you can use a very short exposure, and using the EM gain, you can still have a good signal. So there's a lot of benefits here, um, and also the ability of getting the fast speeds without damaging your sample. Thanks, Ola. Okay. Okay, I've got a question here for Susan. Um, this is from Jeremy Sanderson again. Um, do you have any guidance on selecting between palm storm and other methods such as SIM and STED? Well, uh, this is always a really uh, challenging decision, uh, but it's to a certain extent limited by uh, what you have available in your lab or by the amount of time you're prepared to dedicate to, uh, to creating new systems. So uh, SIM and STED and STORM, well, let's start with SIM. Uh, generally, unless you're using saturated SIM, which isn't so common, so let's say you're using standard SIM, uh, this will give you a factor of three improvement in resolution in all three dimensions, um, which can be very attractive if, you, if that's the level of improvement you need. Um, lots of commercial systems available, uh, and uh, you can also use lots of standard proteins or dyes with it. It's really, um, as long as there's no blinking uh, and not any movement, it really is not significant as to what dye you use or what protein, and so it can be very, very attractive from that point of view. Um, STED, uh, it's, uh, it has the uh, attraction compared to SIM and STORM that you get an image directly. You don't need to do any processing. So I think that does make it very attractive. Um, it is much more um, complex in its setup than uh, STORM. Um, like with SIM, you either tend to need to buy a commercial system or you need to have someone very experienced to set it up for you. With STED, it does depend also on uh, whether you have um, a version which only does XY improvement, which is quite common, or whether you have one that improves the resolution in X, Y, and Z uh, simultaneously. Uh, now, those are less common, but obviously, if you need the axial improvement, it's not going to be any use to you unless you have uh, the version of STED which does give you that axial improvement. Um, and then we have STORM. So STORM gives very high resolution. Um, it does tend to be slower if you want storm to go. If you want storm palm localization to go faster, you're going to have to invest more time in analysis. So it has that disadvantage. Uh, on the plus side, if you only want an improvement in X Y resolution, the setup is very simple, and really is a wide field system with a strong laser. So um, it is uh, very, uh, relatively speaking, very simple to set up. So I think it really depends on three things. What information do you need out of your sample? So what resolution is necessary to get the information you need? And what that means spatial and temporal resolution. Uh, and secondly, what systems do you have available to you? What people do you have available to you? What expertise have you got to make these things happen? Thank you, Susan. Um, and a question here for Orla. This is from David Nest at the University of Connecticut. Uh, please, can you elaborate on the device that fools the camera into thinking the chip is smaller, uh, and what is it doing? Yep, that's no problem. So, um, David, we use the Opto mask, which is um, a physical mask which is used to mask out part of the sensor that you're not interested in. So, the Opto mask is a device which be, it can be connected to the camera. It's a C-mount attachment, and it's basically got blades on it. So they're, they're metal blades which can be moved to um, decide or to, to mark out the area that you're not interested in. So you would be able to um, look at your image live on your, in your software, and then looking at your image, you can decide what size you're interested in. So for example, if you wanted to look at a 128 by 128 region of interest, you choose this in your software, and then while it's live, you actually move the, the blades on the OptoMask. So you're then physically masking the sensor that, that's not of interest to you. So because the, the mask is present, light will not fall on this part of the sensor. Um, therefore, the um, sensor doesn't have to actually transfer any photons from pixel to pixel in this particular area. 
and therefore you can achieve very, very fast frame rates because it's looking at just this particular um, region and the rest of the area is masked. So it's really thinking it's only a 128 by 128 sensor. And when it gets then to the readout node, it just dumps all of the charge that isn't of interest to it. So all of the pixels that have no data in them, they're dumped and immediately the, the frame rates are increased. So I hope that helps. Thank you. Okay. Um, and a question now for Susan. Um, is there a specific advantage to using photo-switchable dyes um, opposed to dyes that switch spontaneously? Uh, well, there is. If, uh, firstly, um, if you want to avoid any possible chromatic aberration issues, then a photo-switchable, um, photo-activatable dyes can allow you to read out two colors into a single channel um, that means you don't have to split the sensor, you don't have to uh, worry about chromatic aberration, so they can be very attractive from that point of view. The other issue is if you want to go um, both as fast as possible and control the density as much as possible, then photo switchable dyes are really the only uh, way to give you enough control, particularly if you want to image in multiple colors. Thank you for that. Um, and a question for Orla here. Um, why is cooling the camera important? Um, okay, so that, that's a very good question. Um, cooling the camera is extremely important because you want to basically minimize the dark current. Um, so for example, if you're using um, an EM CCD for your super resolution and you haven't cooled your camera, all of the dark charge or the, the dark electrons will have built up in your sensor. Um, and these will actually be amplified as well as your signal if you use the EM gain on the camera. So you, it'll be very hard to distinguish your signal, especially if, if it's a, an extremely low light signal or a single molecule, to distinguish this from your dark noise. So um, the ability to cool your camera down um, is very important. And with the MCCGs, you can generally cool with air to about minus 85 degrees. And you can also add water um, cooling and cool it to a further minus 100. So also, um, in addition for any experiments which require very long exposure time, um, cooling the camera is important here because obviously the longer your exposure is, um, the higher the, the dark noise is, especially if you haven't cooled the camera. So for those um, very low light applications such as bioluminescence or luminescence or in vivo imaging, um, cooling the camera is extremely important. Thank you. Um, and a question for Susan. Um, how long does a 3 d algorithm typically take to run? Uh, well, we run um, patches separately. So a patch would be an area of a couple of microns by a couple of microns. And, and this is really the uh, drawback of the 3 d algorithm. This is where you're trading off acquisition speed for uh, analysis speed. It takes about four hours to run that single patch. Um, now, you can um, parallelize that, so in that you can run multiple patches simultaneously, uh, and uh, we can do that. We have just been developing a new script that will chop your image up automatically and then remove overlapping regions, um, but it does take quite a long time. There was a, um, a plugin a, a plug developed by uh, some researchers in China who allow you to use the Amazon cloud to run it if you don't have the computing resources to do it yourself. But it uh, does take a very substantial amount of time. Thanks. That's really interesting. Okay, I have um, a question here for Orla. Um, can Xyla be used for various applications, um, for example, cell motility? Um, yes, uh, Xyla, so I suppose the, the Xyla is uh, it's our SCMOS camera and we call it a workhorse camera. We call it a workhorse camera because it can basically uh, cover a range of applications. Um, and this is because it has a very large field of view, it has a very small pixels um, which allow for excellent resolution, very fast frame rates and um, also it has um, two exposure modes. So uh, well, the Xyla 4.2 has a rolling shutter exposure mode whereas our Xyla 5.5 and Neo have what we have is a global shutter and a rolling shutter. So if you're looking at very dynamic events, 
um, where, for example, your sample might be running faster than the exposure mode of the camera, this is where a global shutter mode would be very important. Um, if you don't, uh, or if, you're, if your sample is moving fast and you don't have a global shutter mode, you have um, the effect of distortion can be apparent in your imaging. So um, obviously it, it only affects um, not every application, and in general the majority of life science or biological applications, I should say, where you're looking at vesicular movement inside cells, will be very well suited to a rolling shutter. So the, the, the movements have to be extremely fast. So blood flow, for example, um, generally needs a global shutter mode to be imaged. Or um, if you're looking at microfluidic um, dynamics, so cells being pushed through micro, microfluidic channels, and this is also where global shutter is very important. Um, so having both modes allows you to be flexible. Um, um, so it's very important, yeah. But it covers a range of applications. So it can be used for fixed cell imaging as well, so fluorescent uh, imaging, not just dynamic experiments. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, I'm afraid that's all we have time for just now. Um, thank you again to our speakers today for their wonderful presentations and for answering all the questions, and also to you, the audience, for, for dialing in. Um, you can watch this webcast again at any time on nature.com slash webcast. And thank you for watching.